Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, Christopher Cole, uh, credits his I'm saying that right now. I always yeah. want to say Christopher Cole because you are. Uh, Christopher Cole uh, credits his father with his love of language. What's big and red and eats rocks? A big red rock eater. Uh, he has published extensively in both online and print journals and written three books, which recently, uh, most recently a collection of poems about the Holocaust and the effects of it on its survivors, um, and the first generation after it, entitled Every Day I Will Remember. Christopher also occasionally writes short fiction. His story, Wade, won the editor's choice for fiction in Inis uh, Inscape Magazine 2016. Christopher's writings explore the human, spiritual, and natural worlds. You can also check him out on Facebook including his author's page, Christopher Cole Writer. He is accompanied in an unusual way today, uh, presenting his work and wishes to thank myself, Eric Peter Schwartz, and Michaela Gibson. Um, Christopher hopes you enjoy the performance and find it valuable and thought-provoking, and afterwards books will be available for sale for $10 a copy, signed or unsigned. Uh, just a couple of notes, please. Quiet your cell phones. And uh, we do ask that if you hold your applause until the end of the whole performance, rather than after each individual performance or each individual poem, because we kind of have worked this out to kind of have a flow to it. So, uh, so just hold it until we're done, and you'll know when we're done. Trust me. So, other than that, we're ready to begin. Uh, Christopher welcomes you all, and uh, if you could just put your hands together for Christopher Call. between the wars. I am looking at a family picture taken on a beach on the Baltic Sea where the family had a dacha. The date is 1937 or 38, and I only ever knew two of those pictures. My grandmother, who died in 1967 when I was 11, and my mother, still living. The rest died in the war in Stalin's purges. How did this picture survive? They're looking into the sun. My uncle Werder's eyes are squinting, his head slightly turned. My great grandmother's are simply shut. The wind is blowing, whipping up the pale sea behind them, and the women's and my mother's bobbed hair is blowing off to the side. Perhaps my great-grandmother's eyes are shut because of the wind, too. They're all in swimming togs, except my great-grandparents. She is wearing a print dress and sandals. He is in striped trousers, braces, a long-sleeved white shirt, and holds a hat. My grandmother, who must be 24 or 5, is in high heels, even though she's wearing a swimsuit and she holds a float shaped like a frog. Is that for my mother? The more I look at this picture, the more I see resemblances. Great Aunt Lita looks like her father. My mother now looks like her mother then. I look like my grandfather, Toivo. And when I look at the back of the picture, where my mother has written names and dates, my heart seizes for a moment. These vibrant people on a summer beach in 1937 or 38, and the terrible cataclysm of dates. 1886 to 39, Lita. 1915 to 41, Arvo. 1911 to 42, Pia. 1934 to 43, Marike. 1914 to 45, Toivo. And 
Allied soldier upon liberating the camps. The mud I slosh through is all that remains of grandparents, fathers, mothers, sisters, brothers. I vomit. When the camps are liberated, there is no cheering, no shouting mazel tov. There is only silence. The living skeletons do not know what has happened. But then, one hand rises in a blessing, and soon a few more. And then, almost everybody who has strength. Once prisoners, now refugees, they are given clothes, boots, blankets. They are also given food and chocolate, but they are so weak translucent almost, and they can take only a little food, a little tea. Are they happy? Surely they must be, but they weep. Even the soldiers, all of them, weeping, weeping. bright air or sea from Euripides Orestes. This was the long turn, the long road, the black road turning into the black wood, the pine wood, pokeweed, black as the black water, as the black water weeds in the swollen river, the thick serried water. This was the long turn. This was the way it had to begin. This was the long turn falling like the last thought, turning deep into the long night, the black coal turning into itself, into its thick black center, the lurid air dank and festering, its black smell smeared in the black night, congealed in the black wood, clotted like the black water weeds in the swollen river, turning in the bright wounded air turning the way the earth turned deep in the long night, turning in the black wood, silent in the deep night, turning like the festering river, turning in its lurid center, turning, turning in the torn and swollen air, the bright bloody air, turning to itself, weeping like the sea. Nobody is. We are refugees, living in a black forest, alone yet together, still lonely even so. When a dog howls, join in. The arms of the wind will embrace you. monochrome, gray, mud, gray mud, ash, ashes floating in a thick gray slurry of river, gray, gray stones, jaw bones, gray, hiding in the woods, the gray woods, eating dead gray animals, gray trees, damp leaves, gray with mold, in the camp, gray soup, a pebble, one bit of gray potato, in a tin cup, cold, gray, shaved gray heads, lice, gray skin, death gray from typhus, women in gray dresses, 
gray men in gray striped, striped pajamas, all the great gray effects of the Jews in gray boxes, a gray, minor, shadowed infraction, and the silver flash of a bayonet, gray between ribs, visible in gray, broken, broken, gray, dead bodies. Inventory. Neatly separated and piled shirts, pants, blouses, skirts, and dresses, old hats, gloves, once glamorous coats and suits, and 89 pairs of shoes, muddied, torn soles flapping, and the feet that once fit these precisely lined up shoes, also gone. The foot bone connected to the ankle bone, the ankle bone connected to the leg bone, to the knee bone, hip bone, etc. Some hidden, wrapped in leaves, bark, tied with vines, or gone entirely, lost along with the bodies they once grounded, grounded in the thick black ash of midnight, blinded by the ever-blazing camp lights with nowhere to hide and only one place to go. Zetas and Bubby's plant root vegetables. 
and lay their dead sons on top for plant food and then cover all with wet earth. Someday we all must eat. son Levi, 12 years old, into the camps. We were both assigned to labor, but in separate areas. I saw him only occasionally, but I could see he was surviving, starving, but still alive in his tattered striped pajamas. When we were freed and reunited, he was stiff, silent, no hugging, no yelling, no tears, and I vowed in that moment I would never bring another child into this world. I have kept my vow. My son died shortly after the war. His skeleton collapsed from starvation. I was stricken, but did not cry. Instead, I continued to live his stiffness his silence, and live on scraps I find on the streets. This is war's eternal legacy. Surya sets the town on fire. She didn't speak English, but she knew the language that mattered. She was a foreign knockout. And while the boys were ogling her, sunning on the rocks, she was saying in a wordless language, come here boys, arching her back. You boys in white t-shirts and tight Levi's, Come, and I teach you syntax of sex. Falling into winter, the young boy holds a hand-warmed nickel, head leaning into his mother's hip, clenching his teeth, torn between desire and need. They have been up and in the streets, effervescent with the remains of last night's rain, up for the renaissance of daylight, hoping to find food, a warm place, comfort in each other, someone to teach the boy the ways of the world, although maybe he already knows. But alone is really just alone again, and the day has passed unsuccessfully. Belated is a bruise, the dark presses in, and mother and son sigh, falling into winter. somewhere by the sea. I am not a gardener. I lie on a bed of dark sea grass, the wind sifting across my body, lingering over my legs, ribs, my hollowed chest, through my wind-tossed hair. At night, the sea is cool, placid. The wind has stopped, yet still, I lie on the dark sea grass in the moonless midnight silence. Slowly, the earth and I sink together. We remember floating bright in the dark waters of the womb. Somewhere in the distance, a candle smolders like the scent of grief. A 
mother's prayer to her son, remember me. I gather the wind in the palm of my hand, son of my womb, son of my vows. You have stirred my shadow to life. I am the vine without a name, wrapped around a green, green briar as an old, almost forgotten ballads and tales. Silence, dark, black, Hooves, owl bones, white pine, oak, sugar maple, a deer dead by the side of a silent road, feathers, stone, frosted ferns on the windows, lit by bright sheets of moonlight. It is in memory that we define ourselves. The old stories on the other side of knowledge, bright clots of blood, waves of time, shaping rocks, hills, valleys, boundaries of distant lakes, gravel roads in an old gray town, and one paved street with old gray stores surrounded by dairy farms, corn, beet, wheat fields, truck gardens, shadows lengthened by the dying light. Tell me, what color is my fear of the dark? <laughs> My dog death. My dog is death. We take walks in the long fields of shadows between the deep land and the sea once deep, but now dry, where only salt and the copper taste of blood remain, and in my mind a tangled heap of bones. But in this new country, as death leads me, I remember scripture and feel his warm, soft coat. A soft tongue can break bones. I will live after all, O oh, maid. Joy and 
breathe. I live, I live alive, rejoicing. Mazel tov, mazel tov, mazel tov. Shalom, shalom, shalom. Baruch atah Adonai. Blessed is the Lord. Thank you. And uh, um, didn't know if there would be questions or answers or anything you wanted. Um, the book is, is uh, based on my family's experience, but also others' uh, experiences, uh, friends of mine's parents and grandparents and stuff, um, uh, and, and their experiences with it and the stories they had to tell and, and so on. So, um, but as I say, it's, it's based basically on my family, but with other things. And uh, so, anyway, if any of you have any questions or comments or anything you want to make, or no, it's okay. Okay. I think maybe most of your friends know more of your family, but if they, if there's anyone here who doesn't know your connection to the Holocaust or who your family is, I think you should say something about that. Okay. Well, my, the, the first poem I read by myself, the photograph, Baltic Sea, um, my, my family was Jewish in Estonia. And um, they were Jewish, and they began to see what was coming. And so they tried to get new papers and convert to a non-Jewish religion and change their name and you know, do all these things. To, to get away with it, but it didn't work. My grandfather, Toivo, never made it out alive. He was uh, captured and um, dragged out of his house and uh, dragged a, a ways away and then shot to death. And then they came back for the family. And meanwhile, they're getting other parts of my family. They're gathering up everybody in Estonia. There's not a lot of Jews in Estonia, but there's a lot of Jews everywhere, so you know, uh, uh, they got into that. Um, what happened was that um, everybody in the family, except for my grandmother, Elfrida, and my mother, Saria, who burned the town, set the town on fire, um, and that's a true story. I, I could go into a whole long story about that, but I won't. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, they survived it and became displaced persons. And the United Methodist something something rescued uh, DPs. That's what they refer to it by short DPs. And my my particular family that survived it were in the refugee camps, the Allied camps, um, until 1952. Um, so they were there a long time after the war. But the reason for that was, and what helped them survive the war, was that my grandmother was an incredibly gifted woman. She was a medical doctor, licensed. She was a concert pianist. She used to do uh, tours of Europe, playing the piano, doing recitals and things. Um, and she also spoke 11 languages fluently. So the uh, allies, being mostly Russians and Americans doing these camps, like anyone would think, you know, Americans don't speak any other languages. You know, and uh, I saw a great sign, if I can digress for a minute. It said, if you think somebody's speaking broken English and you want to criticize them, don't. It means they know another language. <laughs> and and I, I've always remembered that. I thought that was a great, great sign. But anyway, my grandmother became very, very useful to the Allies because there were a lot of Nazi POWs and soldiers and things, and they couldn't speak German. Um, and uh, so my grandmother would uh, translate for the Allies what the soldiers, the POWs, had to say and then note it down. And if there were medical needs, there weren't medics there. Um, the Allies did get medics in to help, but my grandmother is a, is a confirmed medical doctor, not just an army medic. 
um, uh, was able to provide medical help when necessary. So with being able to do these kinds of things and some things that are not nice, um, and, and I'm sure everybody's heard about that, the things that happened to women in the war and so on, um, and she had to do some of that too, but uh, she managed to survive and save her daughter. And so they came here in 1952. They did not come in through Ellis Island uh, like my Italian relatives did. They came in through Canada. And then they were moved down when a place in America opened up. They were shifted down. The Canadians didn't want them. And they were settled in, of all places, my hometown, Krogan, New York. Um, Nobody knows where that is except me. And uh, actually, it's in the northern part of the Adirondacks of New York. And, <clears throat> and uh, um, there were no Jews there. And the people, it was a town of 600. So they're like, they know what's going on in the war, but they've never seen a Jew before. They had heard of them, but they had never actually seen one. And so this was a big deal, you know, and what are we going to do with them? But a man in Beaver Falls, which also nobody knows where it is, and you could drive right through it and never know. Um, there's two cemeteries and that's it. And uh, um, so there's no real actual living people there. There is now, but not, there wasn't then. Um, and uh, uh, they were given a, a, a man sponsored them, which is what you needed as a DP through the United Methodist Church. A family, uh, a man sponsored them, found a job for my grandmother, um, got my mother into school where she met my father, and even though they didn't, she didn't speak English and he didn't speak Estonian or German, um, they fell for each other. And, uh, but she was a knockout. It, it's really amazing. And uh, so anyway, um, uh, the, the problem was the job my grandmother got that the Whitla fever gave her um, was his secretary. And I thought, how awful is that? And nothing happened there. There were no concerts, there was nothing. Of course there was no synagogue. They were the only Jews in town. And that led to a lot of uproar. Um, but if you wanted a synagogue, you either had to go to Canada or you had to go to Syracuse, which was three hours south by interstate. And so that's what they would do, or they would just do without as, as they could. So my upbringing was a mix of things. And uh, so anyway, there's that. So that's my family's story. They, they came here in 52, and, and uh, when my grandmother got the opportunity, she married a lifelong bachelor um, who taught astronomy at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania. And uh, he was a cultured man. He hated Beaver Falls. His brother still lived there. Uh, he had grown up there, but he couldn't get out fast enough. He got out, got to college, got the astronomy degree, got a professorship, and boom, he was in a place where there was music. He loved music and opera and art and all those things. And my grandmother saw a way out, and, and I won't you know, sugarcoat it. She was not in love with him, but she recognized that he was an opportunity to escape. And he was fine with her. He was thinking, what's a woman like that want with a man like me? You know, but they got married and they lived a happy life and did all kinds of things. He was wonderful to her. He was wonderful to us kids. Um, and uh, so that's the story of my family with the war. Thank you. You're welcome. I hope I didn't go on too long. Oh, it's just very interesting.